Come join Kyle, John and David As they go through what's on the playlist Find out what's everyone's favourite At Chicken Soup for the Soul Entertainment We have a few segments to be honest In and out points, no celebs and the gossip Back in time where we talk about the big M's Coming attractions, what the queue Quick checks, who'll be laughing? You abundantly Welcome to Jewel Redundancy Yes, welcome to Dora Dunsey, the only podcast we can hear all latest in television, entertainment news with too many else with exactly the same opinions. I'm one of those hosts, David Allen, and another one is... John Berwick, and the third one is... Kyle Bridger, I would say that uh, I am the curse for this program because I feel like I'm going to mess something up after being away. John will be our killer because he's the killer director, and Dave... You can be our Fargoese, don't you know? You betcha. You betcha. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wow. We, we got a lot to talk about, a lot to catch up on. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. How's everyone been? I uh, hope you haven't missed us too much here uh, on mm-hmm. the pod. Yeah, we a little bit of a hiatus. Our first one in over a decade where we actually took some time off. Had mm-hmm. some major life events. But uh, here we are. We're ready Too bad to I didn't come back with a hair <laughs> transplant. It would have really made things weird. Come back with he a came hair back. piece or something. <laughs> John's like hair is like blue. He has like a, a yeah. Mike Tyson tattoo. Like just, yeah. we, we all changed. We, uh, we did some things. Yeah. Yeah, we did some things. But oh boy, we got a lot to do tonight. We're gonna catch up on everything we missed over our, the the two months we were off. We got movies. We got TV shows. We have a lot to talk about. We have to jump right into this first segment. John, what is it? In and out points. Yes, it is in and out points. We've been off for a bit, and obviously, as a lot has gone down, you know, I'll run through some some quick top headlines here. Both the WGA the, and, and SAG, the Writers Guild and Screen Actors Guild, those strikes have been settled. Hollywood is back up and running. We got Disney announcing it intends to buy Comcast's stake in Hulu for nearly $9 billion. I saw, John, you sent me something about competing streaming companies like Apple TV Plus and Paramount Plus are discussing uh, offering a cheaper, cheaper bundle altogether. And, you know, you got the enemies coming together to, to work in this new Hollywood. So much going down. Uh, I want to talk about this one story that, you know, came up in the, in the last month here. It involves HBO. HBO Max, Warner Media, that whole mess of a whatever we're calling it these days. And we all remember when Warner Brothers shelved, you know, previously completed movies like Batgirl and, and Scoob Holiday Hunt for tax write-offs last year. Well, they have another one on the list. And this time, the U.S. government may be taking notice. The film Coyote vs. Acme was going to be a live-action CG animation hybrid starring John Cena who has, you know, his Peacemaker uh, deal with with Warner Brothers. He actually had his co-worker there in DC Studios had James Gunn produce and story write this film. Well, this feature, which costs $72 million, is going to be shelled for that tax money. Just thoughts on this, John. There's got to be some loophole somewhere that we're not mm. seeing that's like, oh yeah, if you spend the money to make this, you could write it off and suddenly you have... 800 million worth of taxes resolved and it's like or dissolved or whatever it's like how how is this even remotely supposed to be possibly like profitable for them unless they're in such dire straits that like <laughs> they're negative a couple million and like writing it off reverses i don't i don't know how 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 uh, to, to me, it just feels like mafia related, like money laundering. That's really what it feels like. It feels pretty gross. I don't yeah. know. It's just and but also uh, on the side of like trying to work with the people that make your product. What a better way to piss them off than just keep shelving all their projects. Yeah. It just seems so silly and stupid. But isn't there that Hollywood accounting? Doesn't this all make sense in the in that world? I don't know. Uh, th- to me, this just reminds me of of the Seinfeld bit where Kramer, you know, tries to send Jerry's broken stereo in the in the mail to you know to get the rebate or the the write off, and they're like, you know, they they just write it off. Write it off what? I don't know, but <laughs> they're the ones writing it off, and it's just like, 
Yeah, this I don't understand. Like they spent seventy two million dollars, and what are they getting back? Mm-hmm. Like, are, are they really getting seventy two million back? I don't think so. Like, it's just wild. And I mentioned, you know, the 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 government, you know, is is taking notice. Well, we got Congressman Joaquin Castro of Texas. He's calling for a federal investigation of this now frequent practice that Warner Brothers Discovery is doing. He said, "quote." The WD tactic of scraping fully made films for tax break is predatory and anti-competitive. As the Justice Department and the FTC revise their antitrust guidelines, they should review this conduct. As someone remarked, it's like burning down a building for the insurance money. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there there has to be something going on underneath all of this uh, where somebody's making some kind of money somewhere. So, I mean, some money is exchanging hands somewhere. It seems very, very shady. Yeah, it's like a, I don't I don't know the exact thing, but it's like when Mitt Romney like had KB Toys and it went under, and he's like, "Hey, I made a, a gazillion dollars." It's like, <laughs> what? How does this all. happen? I didn't know that. Um, yeah, but yeah, like, and I think you mentioned it, Kyle. Like, there, there's been so much like outcry of, 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 about this, and for a very good reason. This is the people that spend a year, two, three years working on something like this, put blood, sweat, and tears, and then they have nothing to show for it at the end. There's nothing mm. in their reel. There's nothing mm. on their resume. They're like, mm. oh, what have you been up to? You know, why, what's this gap here? Well, I was working on this film. Oh, what film? Can I watch it? Can I check it out? Can I see your work? You know, maybe to get you this next job? No, nothing. You have nothing. You don't have a still. Yeah. You don't have a, a video. No, I don't. Because it's a write-off, and it's just like it's just so unfortunate. And I, I saw Warner Brothers was maybe like after this possible, you know, uh, investigation, we, the outcry. They are trying to shop the film to other studios and streamers, so maybe it won't be uh, a write-off. Maybe it'll be sold to whatever Netflix, Amazon for X million dollars, and they'll get something from it. Who knows? But like, it's just there. There's been so much outcry that you would think, okay. Lo- Looney Tunes. We we shouldn't touch this. This is beloved. Don't mess with Looney Tunes. That's what the, mm. the headline should be for Warner Brothers Discovery. A few weeks later, we get this announcement that Looney Tunes was going to be pulled from Max. And now, supposedly it was just a mistake. But it got a lot of people wondering, like, if you can't make a beloved franchise work, that's like almost the the symbol of your company in some aspects, what do you even do? Like, well, how are these executives still in charge? Like, Who's making this decision to do a seventy million dollar Roadrunner movie and then not writing it off? And oh yeah, that that Bugs Bunny, he's a nobody. Let's pull that from the service. It's I don't. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that you'd want some kind of kids entertainment on yeah. on the streaming platform. I mean, isn't that a big thing when like Netflix they get a bunch of yeah, stuff I through mean, like Disney Plus? Coco I mean, that's like their all, whole service. And yeah. I feel like this is just like all like I feel like the news when these companies nowadays it's like it's just like a testing ground because it's like yeah oh it's like you know maybe they'll say like it's oh. like the Oscar thing yeah Oscars oh we may have cast this person as Superman and like there's like this rumor going around and Twitter's mm-hmm. like no we don't like it this is the worst and it's like oh yeah. that was actually just a rumor that was not real it's actually <laughs> this person the person the Twitter happened to say would be perfect instead yeah. and it's like this is what happened here where it's just like. What Looney yeah. Tunes is going away, and then uh, you know somebody in the you know an executive up there is like, uh oh, people don't like this. Oh yeah, it was a mistake. It wasn't going anywhere. You know, it's like come on, but yeah, it's silly. But yeah. I mean, Looney Tunes are a staple. Yeah, yeah, of Warner Brothers, man. I mean, yeah. I don't know what they're doing over there. I don't know if it's soon. It's just going to be all like say yes to the dress and my 90 day fiance and my 600 pound life and all that. I mean, I think that's what they're going for because it's cheaper to create and it's just pervasive everywhere. I'm telling you, I think the guy at discovery has some dirt on the Warner brothers people. And I mean, mm. uh, uh, yeah. And, and uh, HBO people. And it's just like, mm. you know, that's why they're getting the be- best end of every deal. Like, yeah, I don't know. Th- I don't know. No more HBO in the, in the title of Max. And maybe HBO is just is just busy, you know, making up their Twitter army here. And that's our next in and out point. Uh, speaking of Twitter, you know, uh, HBO has their own recent uh, controversy. In a story first reported by Rolling Stone, it was discovered during a wrongful termination investigation that Casey Bloys, 
HBO's then president of original programming had a secret army to push back against TV critics posting tepid reviews of HBO titles. So this former worker said Bloys was obsessed with Twitter and wanted to always pick a fight. And her, her boss asked, is there any way to create a dummy account that can't be traced to us to do Bloys' bidding? <sighs> I, I always love like execs and, you know, these like, it's just Hollywood people. It's just like, yeah, is there a way to like do this, you know, like behind the scenes stuff? And it's just like, you guys don't understand how even like basic like Twitter works or just like yeah. basic like internet. Like it's just, you, I know. you're just old and you're just, I don't know. Uh, but they're just uh they're the ideas men mm-hmm. dude that's and their ideas we're here aren't for the big good, ideas though. the big idea <laughs> their big ideas aren't good their small ideas aren't good they just write them off and some of these i gotta be honest uh, sorry yeah. i don't even know the story yet but like it it doesn't surprise me at all i mean in the sports world i think kevin durant who's like a major major superstar has like several burner accounts he's talked about where he just trash talks people it's like how fragile is your ego that you have to do this? Yeah. And I mean, what we know about Twitter at this point is like, it's like the smallest yeah. of margins of actual users. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing yeah. this for? They're all bots. They're all probably the same person. It's like the catfish like situation. It's yeah. like, I'm interacting with this fake person who's interacting with this fake one that I made up. It's just a web of yeah. lies. And some of the tweets included one directed toward Vulture um, screenwriter, um, of a Perry Mason episode uh, and said, a somewhat elitist take, is there anything more traumatic for men and now women than fighting in a war? Sorry if that seems too convenient for you. Uh, there was one from our, for a Rolling Stone TV critic, Alan Sepinwall, for his review of The Nevers. Boyce texted one uh, to his, texted out to one of his employees, can our secret operative please tweet at Alan's review? Alan is always predictably safe and scared in his opinions. But I think my favorite one, which is the one that John has uh, posted here, um, is a tweet coming from the fake Kelly Shepard on Twitter. Uh, that's actually coming from, you know, Casey Bloys, who, I mean, uh, you know, we got, we got, well, it's important that Casey is a white man and Kelly here is a white woman. But the uh, tweet was, maybe our friend needs to say what a shock it is that two middle-aged white men are essing on a show about women I effing hate these people. Yes. So this Kelly Shepard, who again is Casey, is saying, yeah, man, look at you two white men messing with this show about women. It's like, wait a minute here. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. It's all. I mean, in a in a bigger sense, like this is going to be absolutely pervasive everywhere in the next. 10, 20 years. I mean, this is all it's going to be. And if de- if decisions are being made based on this silly stuff, I mean, we're it's a crazy rabbit hole we're going down. For $5, you can have all of your tweets highlighted forever. Not forever, but for, for the month mm-hmm. or whatever. So it's like, it, it's it's such an inconsequential barrier to entry that like, yeah, every every yeah. spam bot that I, that I have DMing me has verification. Like, and, and those yeah. are always pushed to the front because they paid money. And it's, it's yeah, it's the barrier of entry is too easy, and yeah, like you said before, yeah. it's it's people who are like, you know, oh, I got to get back at them, but they can't know it's me. Like, yeah, because it's, it's, yeah, it's like, what is this solving? You are the head of HBO. Do you really yeah. care if all the reviews are hundred percent positive all the time? Your success rate is already so high, and it's like I trust Alan Sepinwall of Rolling Stone. I, I look at his reviews; he's a great critic. But like a reply from at Kelly S H three three eight eight nine three five six. What? Who? Why will I care if oh, she disagrees with? I don't trust that person. <laughs> like, and why would yeah. you not focus your ten minutes of energy into trying to improve things to make people yeah. like it more instead of just trying to put down the people who disagree? Like, it just yeah. doesn't make Wild. sense. Wild. Well, oh boy, that's what's going on over there on. Um, the the max service um let's turn to what's going on on amazon and that's where we got a new trailer a new show coming out in 2024 it's time for coming attractions here are some exciting coming attractions all right we're gonna be talking about the fallout trailer which just dropped um fallout's not coming out until april 12th of next year but this series based on the popular video game uh depicts 
the aftermath of a nuclear war in an alternate history of a 1950s-esque retro-futuristic world. And I want to throw to John first, you know, obviously our, our video game expert here, I, but I know you've been interested in, in you know, this series and how they're going to adapt it. Uh, what did you think of the trailer? I thought it was interesting. Um, I liked seeing some of the CGI and how they're approaching some of these things. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of diverging lore in the Fallout series because you have a couple that were made by the original people and then Todd Howard, who I believe is one of the directors or showrunners or something on here who runs Bethesda Game Studio or is um, high up there in there. Um, his company, Bethesda Studios, bought the rights to it and have made a bunch more games on top of it. So the, the lore kind of goes in a couple different directions, but um, it was interesting to see their takes on like power armor and stuff like that. You know, it looks pretty, pretty similar to the game, if anything, maybe a bit taller, a bit bigger. Um, but, you know, I, that's kind of the stuff that interests me is, is how they're taking stuff out of the game and directly adapting it to the screen. Because pretty much anything that's in there, like the monsters and the armor and all that, was all 3D modeled already for the, for the video games. So you probably had all those assets offloaded to somebody to um, probably up res and, and, you know, give more detail and maybe um, make it a bit more lifelike and stuff. So I don't know. That's the kind of stuff I've been looking for in the trailer. Um, there wasn't a ton of story. There wasn't a ton of anything else. So there's really not much else to, yeah, for me to sink teaser. my teeth into. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested. It seems like it's the same studio doing the VFX as the boys, if I understand correctly. Well, I think it's just, it, it's from the studio, like the studio, like as an Amazon oh, studio that brought studio. you okay. the boys and okay. fast delivery. I don't know if you saw I, that. Yeah, in I did there. see that with the asterisks on it. I don't know yeah. what, I don't know what fast delivery is, but. Um, I think early, I'm pretty sure earlier trailers did say like two day shipping. And I don't know if like that's like a th like maybe it was some kind of like legal thing. It's like, well, in some places we can't offer two day shipping. And and then this place you have to have the prime subscription. Like, I don't oh, know. If that was, and that's why I they see. changed it. Because I swear I saw a two day shipping. That's and now it just show. says fast delivery. That's, that's no, no, no. It's, it's literally Amazon. I, see. Yeah. I didn't even catch that. All right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm interested. I've been interested for a while. I actually got to go see. On Staten Island, they filmed outside of a, uh, I think it was a shop, right, that was closed, which mm. will be a set piece in the show, uh, oh, cool. the Super Duper Mart, which might be what's behind him in that image. I don't think it is, but... What's that um, say that, like, they can go to Staten Island to uh, do a 1950s uh, <laughs> retro-futuristic <laughs> nuclear apocalypse you yeah. know, world? Okay. Uh, I, we got to, I got to drive fast and check it out when I was visiting some friends over there, so it was interesting. They had, you know, a bunch of rusted out cars and a bunch of sand and dirt all over the parking lot and stuff so it was well disguised but um yeah I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm interested in it i i like the boys I, I like some of the stuff that's been coming out of amazon recently so i'm hoping that this is yeah. of the same caliber or better but you know i guess time will tell yeah kyle what about you are you familiar with the game i can't remember if you've played it or um not. i i know of the game i but i've never played it myself i know it has like that 1950s twinge to it so it's like uh that's why i was glad to hear that in the music in the in the trailer that was cool um this thing looks beautiful it looks really nice amazon um, has that money yeah um <laughs> so i mean there was absolutely no story i mean it's hard to follow what's going on but a lot of cool stuff it looks like happening and it looks great so i'm interested to see what they what they got but the some of the shots looked really cool um so i would be interested um you know didn't jonathan nolan work on westworld yeah. and that's always like yeah, jonathan that, nolan and lisa joy are behind this that they was developed this and they also <laughs> yeah. developed westworld so so hopefully they have a plan in place is all i'll say and they've got something to go off of so maybe if they can yeah, adapt they're it. adapting so hopefully yeah. that's good you have yeah. the, the basis there i mean sure westworld there it was you know a book and a, a movie and but like i think season one of westworld oh that's great but then when yeah, we get yeah. out of that it's like oh where are we going here and i think yeah. okay this first season of fallout hopefully you know will be pretty good like we're gonna follow you know the the last of us kind of thing you know they borrowed a lot of stuff from the video game to the show it worked out really well i think the cast in this you know it's a fun cast you got michael emerson doing his creepy ben linus you know type stuff there from lost chris parnell you know mm -hmm. looks like without any eyes you know just being funny like he usually is 
Mark Cherry, Wal- Walton Goggins, Kyle, Kyle McLaughlin, a lot of people in this that you've seen before. Mm-hmm. So that's exciting. And then for me, yeah, I'm I'm going to definitely check it out. It looks really cool. Uh, I hope, you know, we'll see how far it goes in like with the sci-fi because it, it, a lot of creatures and robots and spaceships and sometimes, you know, I know it's not the same, but like Lord of the Rings, you, you lost mm-hmm. me with when it's that kind of stuff. But if it's more of like the grounded as much as you can be like the boys where yeah they're superheroes but it's like you know or like the last of us like yeah there's all this stuff going on but it's still like real world Mm. like stuff but yeah for the most part it is i think the important thing to know is that back before the bombs dropped that started this world um they had things like they had cars but they were nuclear powered cars so the cars had like little nuclear reactors in the back or you know they'd have uh, a robot that would cut your hair, but it's like big and bulky and crazy, and you know, like like like, like it's not it's not sleek modern. Is it's, it's like the old fashioned like future retro, like we said, mm-hmm. kind of modern stuff. So most of the stuff is pretty grounded in that. You know, what if technology was old but new? You know, like so yeah. it, it it's it's pretty good. At least the games cool. are. All right, so we'll have to wait and see. We got until April until we get to see Fallout on Prime Video. We have another show that's ready to go. We've been talking a lot about streamers. Let's move over to Netflix. In order to talk about this one, let's let's bring in Terry Hatcher. And by the way, they're real oh. and they're spectacular. Yes. Yeah, so this show is is it? It's definitely real, but is it spectacular? I'm going to talk about Squid Game: The Challenge. Now, this is the Netflix reality series based off of the South Korean drama Squid Game. And it features 456 players competing for a $4.56 million grand prize. Nine episodes have been released so far over two weeks, starting on November 22nd. The finale will be on Wednesday, so we don't know the winner yet. I'm going to do my best. I won't be like, spoiling it. You know, player one, two, three was out in this. Like, I won't do that really, but I will be talking about some of the games and, and stuff like that to kind of give you a little bit of uh, a summary of what's going on in Squid Game The Challenge, because, you know, obviously Squid Game was was big. I don't think any of you guys checked this one out, uh, but it, it's one of their top shows right now uh, on Netflix. And I went in with a lot of apprehension with this, mostly like wondering, like, did Netflix even understand the point or like moral of the original show? Of like this big corporation getting these poor people to play for our amusement, yep. you know, it's like, well, yep. what are we doing here? Like, Wasn't this the one too where they had hypothermia scares for people? We'll get to that. Okay. Yes, we will get to that. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, but and then yeah, and then as a reality TV fan, it's like, how can you even follow f- 456 contestants? Like, yeah, Survivor has a hard enough time with 20. Like, I don't get how you could do this. But so I went in and I'm like, how are they going to do this? And of course, you know. I'll say like the first game, red light, green light. This is my conspiracy. You know, I don't know how many of these people were actually contestants because it's like, were they paid extras? Did, you know, Mm. we lost 259 people in this first game in red light, green light. They go into the, uh, the bunker afterwards, you know, with all the beds. It's like, you don't have 456 beds. Like you, did you only have whatever, 180 beds you could fit in that space. So that's all we're going to have in this thing like who knows the exact thing and like how can you actually track any of these people with that motion sensor like Mm -hmm. and yeah we talked about it john yeah like the the cluster f of the shoot that this was like you in this thing you don't see their breasts but you could see like their hands in their pocket like just like you could tell they are cold and there'd be points when like somebody like would pause in like a squat and like you'd be like why did i do this and they make it seem like it's just a five minute game, but as we've heard, it's, it took hours. <laughs> so then, yeah, if you're in a squat, you could hold it, yeah, for 30 seconds or whatever it is, you know, for the uh-huh. red light, green light game. But if it was like 20, 40, 50 minutes in between the takes, yeah, I could understand why you're like, I can't do this. Yeah. Like, I'm out. Like, yeah. Um, and yeah, there's it becomes like a. It uh, becomes like an intense endurance competition. Yeah. That's insane. And they're threatening lawsuits over in- injuries that they've suffered during this. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll wait and see that lawsuit. I'm sure that'll be an in and out point, you know, at some point with how that shakes out. But speaking of injuries, I will talk about how they, you know, to address the elephant in the room. No, of course, they don't die in this show. But they, what they do is they do have like these like squibs like in their outfits that go off 
and it kind of lets out this like bloodshot. But I will say, it's interesting. It's it's not red. It's black. It's like this black bloodshot. And I wonder if that's some kind of like S and P note where it's like probably. All right, we don't need like this thing making it seem like it's yeah. blood. But it's like you're you're going already to like the line. Like yeah. it's get to tiptoe, just like change the color. Like it seems like weird. It's like we can do everything but that. And then, like, they pretend that they're dead once they, like, they get shot. They just, like, you know, fall over, you know, whatever. Some of them, you know, are emotional and, and this and that. And so they play into that. But we do the classic games, Red Light, Green Light, the cookie. Uh, but they also update some of the other ones to make it fair for everyone. Like, all these teams are like, oh, we got to get a build, you know, a strong team. We got tug of war coming, you know, get all the bros together. And they all go into this thing thinking it's going to be tug of war. And it's like Battleship. They do like this human version of like Battleship. So it's more of like a strategy, you know, uh, type game instead of a, a strength based game. So I like that when they like fake them out. But what annoys me, though, is like what that while they were planning on tug of war, they knew about the cookie. They knew about all the shapes and all this stuff like they were ready for that. Nobody remembered marbles like. Because oh, at one yeah, point, yeah, yeah. They, they tell them, okay, we're going to pair up. Everyone pair up. We got a fun little picnic prize. It's going to be a fun little afternoon. And I'm thinking, guys, don't pair up with somebody. Like, do you not remember this? Mm-hmm. Don't pair up with somebody. And then, of course, they pair up. And there's, like, this mother-son that we're actually in squid, this squid game together. They pair up. The best friends oh, pair up. Man. Surprise, it's marbles. It's like, come on, yeah. guys. Like, so for, like if any time in this show they said... We're going to pair up. It's like, nope, I'm, I'm pairing up with my worst enemy. I don't care. I'm- <laughs> <laughs> but um, outside of the games, they have like these like tests, which remind me of like a, like a survivor mole sequester type strategy games where you could like choose to eliminate others. You can uh, there's like public votes. There's risk rewards. There's some fun things that really, I think, add to like the strategy element of like a reality competition show that I would like. And I got into it and so much so I'm going to go on uh, a rant here. Uh, my wife and I, my uh, a couple of my friends who've been watching this, we are so annoyed. I've never been so annoyed with a contestant, an edit, what the show was like doing to us watching it. I'll try to explain the best I can here, but we're doing the glass bridge. We're doing the glass bridge challenge, which supposedly they had stunt doubles for the eliminated contestants what? because <laughs> it, like the glass didn't shatter. It kind of like opened up. You know, if they uh, guessed wrong and then you know, uh, people fell. And I don't know if it's some kind of like mat where like they were only falling like two feet, but then they like erase them out. I don't know how they did it, but like something's going on there. And anyways, the contestants, most of the contestants agree to let's just do one decision. So like player one just has to pick between, you know, 50 50 left or right. And if they survive, player two will overtake them. So then they make the next 50-50 decision. Mm-hmm. So that way it's fair for the players who were assigned one, two, three, four, five. You know, that way one player isn't making like 17 50-50 decisions to try to get over there and yep. have no shot. So that's what they, you know, agree on. That's what they've been doing. Player five, though, does not want to do it. And so we have player three who, you know, is a fan favorite and does it, does their thing. Player four goes ahead and unfortunately guesses wrong. So player four is out. So that means player five your turn to overtake. Yeah. Well, she doesn't want to do it. She doesn't do it. So player three has to keep guessing. Of course, Push her player on. three. <laughs> get, well, player three gets out and everyone's like, come on, like we all agreed to this. Well, the joke's on her because we, when three and four are eliminated, you have to now make the yeah, decision. Yeah. <laughs> and I would have thought at this point, it's like, you know, make her do all of them. All of them. Yeah. But they don't. What they do is like, all right. As soon as she does hers and she survives one, she's like, all right, it's time for someone to overtake me. That's like the fairest way. It's who's up? Who's up? Who's yeah. six? Are you ready? Oh, my yeah. God. And oh, yeah, yeah. my now God. It's, it gets worse. It gets worse. We, we, we skip ahead. Player five makes it. You know, a few other people make it to the next thing. And now we're doing like one of those tests I was telling you about. And you can nominate someone for elimination. And it can even be yourself. So you can nominate yourself for uh, like elimination here. You roll a dice in the you know in this middle here in like this little triangle space if it's a six that person that was nominated is out so one in six shot could be you you know if you nominate yourself they they agree to nominate themselves each time so it's like instead of like you know uh, lord of the flies being like oh. i choose this person i choose that yeah. person getting people hate you choose oh. yourself 
And that way everyone, you know, goes through it once and it's fair. Except one player on that bridge remembered what player five did and says, you know what? No, I, I, I'm, I'm picking, I'm picking her. And she's the first one, you know, to pick somebody now my hair. Of course, she doesn't get out. After this test, which everyone else then picked themselves, everybody hated the person that rolled the dice and nominated player five. What? Why? Every single person. Wow. And here's what wow. annoyed, annoyed us, because it felt like we, the viewer, were being gaslit by everyone. Yeah. Because they did confessionals with everyone else. And they're like, yeah, that was so sneaky. So sneaky what that person did. We all agreed to do this and nominate ourselves. It's like, what? Am I am I missing something? I, I did I not watch that episode correctly? Like what is going yeah. on here? And, That's wild. And then when that person who nominated her tries to apologize, even though she has no reason to, the glass bridge jumper, player number five here, says, Oh, I jumped. Yeah, when you had mm. to jump. Oh like, my god. It was it was so hard to watch, and we were all like so annoyed. And I will say, thankfully. Wasn't in the final three player five. All right. So if you said justice, she won, I was just, gonna be like, "Geez, man, justice that for stinks. the person who, um, you know, played the game correctly." But oh boy, yeah, the finale's coming up on Wednesday. We we're in the final three. It's crazy that one of those players is going to be four point five six million dollars richer, the biggest cash prize I think in in competition TV history. Here, that's a lot of money. And yeah, that is. A it's lot weird of money. because like there's like one contestant. I feel like we we've gone pretty good story with those whole time like the way they have to edit this is weird because it's like they can't show all 456 you know they like you got to get one and then to so get attached to them and then they get out and but you also mm. have to give clues from the beginning of who it is like i'm gonna be curious how it all unfolds because like i will say like the very first person you get a confessional from in this show you're like oh s- s- sad story you know like about mm. like her helping her like you know kids single mom this whole thing She's the first person out in red light, green light, you know? So it's yeah. like, it's, you know, you have to, you keep, they keep you guessing. That's good. You know, another show that does that, that doesn't give a crap, but what happens, Ameri- I think American Ninja yep. Warrior, yeah. they'll do like full 10 minute things. And then first obstacle, they're just down immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of funny when that happens. Yeah. So. yeah, that would be me. That would be me for sure. Oh boy. Well, that is it for Squid Game the Challenge. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how the finale unfolds. We do have a bunch of other things to talk about. Some movies, some TV shows. Uh, you know, we got a few to go through, so we might have to maybe not do a back of time, but maybe a, a quick check. Quick check. Oh, all right. I, I kind of miss, you know, the one episode, this would be the episode for Kyle that he should have started the podcast with, we're back, baby. Yeah. Because we are, we are back this week. We have a lot yeah. to catch up on, but. Do it at the end. We'll edit it in. Yeah, we'll do <laughs> fix it in post. Kyle, what are we talking about? What's your movie? It's also on Netflix. Yeah, we're talking about The Killer, the new David Fincher movie. Um, I was really excited about this movie. I thought uh, based on the trailer, it looked really cool. Um, and then I sat down and I watched it. Uh, and I wasn't too, too oh, thrilled. No. I thought the I thought the music was good. And there's definitely some interesting shots. Um camera wise that uh are there but throughout the entire um movie is michael fassbender narrating basically and i found the narrating to be kind of cheesy uh so it didn't really bring me into this world i think it was supposed to bring me into this world and he's like explaining how he's like this assassin and i just found it honestly just cheesy a little bit um, I, I felt like the storyline, it was constantly building up to this thing and then the payoff wasn't there or as it was about to get good, that's when it ended. So I'm like, I, like it, it left me wanting more, like there should have been more there to the meat of the story. Um, and my biggest, biggest, Uh-oh. biggest complaint with this movie is they have a what could have been a sweet fight scene at the end, and it is good, but it's like 
AI generated fight scene. It's it's like on 2X. It's like listening to a podcast on 2X. It's like all the punches are like super fast mm. in comparison to the rest of the movie where the rest of the movie is slow. So I'm like, maybe they did it intentionally because it was like slowly building up to this point. But it just took me out of it because I'm like, no one can move this fast. I mean, it was just insane. The punches that were thrown were so quick and like lifting up a whole, but like it was just too, mm. it was just deviated from reality too much. And it, a lot of it, I could tell like it looked like it was computer generated. Mm. And I'm like, dude, can we just have like a cool fight scene between people? We did it back mm. in the 80s. Like, why can't we do it now still? That's too It bad. just was a very, very odd thing to do in a movie that didn't feel like it utilized that. And then we get to like the coolest part and it's like all CGI. And it didn't seem like choreography. It seemed like CGI. It was very, very weird. Um, and it really took me out of it. Uh, I was hoping for it to be better. I'm sure some people will like it. Like, it's still a good Fincher film. Like I, But I wanted more, and I thought it could have been cooler. Yeah, I'm surprised Fincher went with, like, the CGI AI stuff. Because, like, you know, I mean, I know he. there's definitely a lot of like, CGI in, like, Mindhunter. Again, it's like mm. one of those things like that Wolf of Wall Street video where it's like, oh, we got to take out this one tree and move the tree here. Like, it's like very like yeah. detailed stuff because he cares so much about details. And that's the thing. It's like to like do so much like CGI. I feel like he's like, he's known for like doing like 100 takes of stuff because it has to be just right. And maybe yeah. it's just he was like, all right, I did too many takes. It's not working. Let me just fix it in post. Like, I mean, I, I mean, this is I it was so weird to me seeing it that that's when I put in the chat that we have with the the good, bad and watchable. I was like, let me know when you guys get to this yeah. fight scene, because I, I got to talk it out because it's just it seemed so not uh, like I know I don't want to sound silly because I know it's movies, but it seems so not real. Like at least in like 80s and 90s. In Fight Club. Like fighting. <laughs> yeah, like in fighting, they like they edit it in a way to where it looks like they're punching. And so, this was just like so fast and just over the top. And I just, it, it, it just was outside the realm of anything that these people could do when you've painstakingly put me in a place of yeah. all the things he does to do to like assassinate people and now we're you know what i mean it just it was very very strange yeah. it was a weird choice too bad yeah i'm I, i'm a big fincher fan i haven't seen it yet i'm i was looking forward to it i i've heard yeah some mixed things i think from you and some some of the other uh folks so i'm hoping but you know oh, it's just maybe maybe fincher should have just you know instead of doing the killer he should have Went with that Space Club movie. I think that would have been the <laughs> the movie to go with. That, and the script was almost done. Like we were, we had the poster. We're ready. Like, yeah. oh yeah. well. But um, John, uh, what do you got? What do you have for us? Uh, I have Gen V, which is a not a spinoff, but a a a side project. Well, I don't even know what you'd call it. Of the boys. Um, a uh, a uh, 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 a beeline. I don't even I don't even know what you'd call it, but um, I I think it's the boys, the college years, or something. Like, yeah, yeah I like, don't know, but uh, in short, if you're a fan of the boys, uh, definitely watch this. Um, it's the same, if not better, CGI and pacing and gruesomeness and action and all that. Uh, there's a couple of characters that I couldn't decide if I liked or didn't like. There were a couple of characters I didn't like. There were a couple of characters <laughs> I did like. Um. I think the main character is a little weak, but I think that's okay because everybody around her kind of supports everything and, and makes it make sense in a way. Um, and um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, they had a bunch of tie-ins to the actual um, boys TV show. Uh, I think their plan originally was to do one season of this and then clear up what remained in the boys itself but it seems like they renewed it for a second season um so uh i'm glad about that it, it was definitely a nice oasis and a, a void of the boys stuff while they uh film more so um definitely definitely uh recommend it if you're into that into the boys but 
I think Kyle, mm-hmm. you said you saw the pilot. No, oh, yeah. I so I, oh, Dave did. I did. Gotcha. I saw the pilot back in September, and I think it was just like the way the schedule was released and how busy October was. Mm-hmm. Because they did that, like, oh, it's like two episodes here, three episodes there, two episodes there. I just, like, fell behind um, with it. But I will say, John, what, what would you say to people, you know, looking at this poster, probably look, watching the trailer? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's like, do I really want, like, because we, I think, initially talked about this, whether it was, like, when they announced the project. that It was like, oh, the boys, but, like, the teen version. Oh, it's it's R- Riverdale, you know, it's, like, yeah. that kind of drama. Do we go into that, or is it the boys just... You know, with some younger folks instead of it's, like it's still that tone. Yeah, it's still that tone. It's the boys with the younger folks. There's a little bit of like collegey drama, but not not really. It all ties into the story. It's not like it's like you know, oh, he left me. Like that's not that's not what it is. You know, <laughs> if something like that happens, it's because it ties into the overall narrative and it makes sense. Um, and uh, you can't go an episode without there being references to stuff we found out in the boys yeah. like um not really a spoiler but we find out that people in this college are ranked and like the higher your rank you know the top rank may have a spot on the seven if they mm. if there's a, a space and stuff like that so it all ties in and it kind of clears up how some of the like how how the superheroes get known and, and stuff like that you know how they gain some popularity and so it all really ties in very tightly to the actual boys show. So uh, I guess that if you watch the boys mm. and you enjoy it, you would be a miss not to at least give this a shot. But mm. I, I think if you like the boys, you'll definitely like this. When I saw the f- first episode, like it, it has the, uh, the graphic stuff that you expect yeah. from the boys, whether it's the violence or even just, uh, I, I'm skating around it, but there is a very memorable scene with an Ant-Man type character in the uh, mm-hmm. the boys. Well, there's something similar, uh, you know, with mm-hmm. two college kids hooking up in this version in the oh, pilot. Boy. So it's yeah, on par, if not more than the yeah. boys. So, yeah. Um, and then who do- yeah, we're going to get they announced, I think, in the last week, the boys, Mexico. Uh I don't know. It's it, <laughs> the boys I, on vacation. No, I, so it's, Cancun. It's, it's 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 a it's another spinoff here. It's a it's like it's weird because like this is the show that the boys would make fun of, like NCIS, and now we have NCIS New Orleans, like millions, yeah. billions, trillions. Like it's yeah. that kind of thing. So I hope they like lean into it and like make like you know know what they're doing, like laugh with us instead of like us going to be like laughing like. No, you guys are just franchising this thing out and making it what you were parodying to begin with. So I think Gen we'll V pays off. I I don't know if more would pay off. You know, that's I guess they're taking that yeah. gamble. But yeah, I I I think that this was worth it. I I guess we'll have to wait and see on the boys in Mexico. Yeah. All right, we're gonna do one more quick round of quick checks here. I'm gonna go with one here. I'm gonna talk about the curse. And now. This series explores how an alleged curse disturbs their relationship of a newly married couple played by Emma Stone and Nathan Fielder as they try to conceive a child while co-starring on their problematic new HGTV show, Flip Lampert... I can't even say it. Flip Flip Lampertopy. Yeah. (laughs) Flip Lampertopy? Say that three times fast. It's Uh, Flip It's a house flipping flipping. show about... Yeah. 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 Oh my god. Produced by a character played by Benny Safdie. It's created and written by Fielder and Safdie. There's been four episodes so far on Showtime. Um, I think John saw the pilot. Uh, I was in just from the get-go. The team behind it, you know, it came out on my birthday. We got Nathan Fielder. We, okay, the uncut gems, you know, Safdie brothers, okay. Uh, oh, Emma Stone, like this combines everything here um it has the cringe it has the uneasiness you find in you know nathan nathan for you in uncut gems there's a moment where like nathan's trying to sneak like a security cam footage from this casino and he's spilling gatorade and it was like this really just awkward scene yeah nathan hearing stuff from like a focus group about his hgtv show and how they don't like his hosting it's like all these things (laughs) feel like they could be nathan for you bits yeah but in this way in this scenario where it's like this drama comedy hybrid real scripted thing they don't feel forced or fake it's it's also shot in a way that's like there's a lot of like unknown actors you know probably like real people from the town 
Um, and like they always will have like objects in the frame, almost like we are like eavesdropping or like watching them from the bushes, like kind of like some behind the scenes footage. So everything, it just makes it feel all real. Maybe it helps, mm-hmm. you know, with like Nathan, you know, and, and a lot of the scenes here. I will say like Emma Stone, knocking it out of the park. I think she's doing great. Benny Safdie, uh, his character, Dougie, I think it feels believable. Maybe it helps because like I'm less familiar with him and he's hiding behind like the wig and the beard that you don't see in like Oppenheimer, you know, so it's like he's like a different person. Nathan, I go back and forth on, you know, the, the big joke we probably saw on like on Kimmel, how he's like playing actually a stiff character on the show. And like, he's actually more of a cool laid back guy in real life. And it's like, you know, sure. it's there's points in this where I, I see I see the stretching. But like, you know, it's it's hard because I'm so familiar with him playing himself. Mm. It, it's going to be hard no matter what. But John, what what did you think of the premiere? I don't know if it was because I only saw one, but I wasn't super into it. Um, You're not a cherry tomato brother here? No. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I just, I think part of what makes Nathan for you so great is that he's, he's playing the straight person to the other person's straight person in the ridiculous scenario. And this has that. But the scenario just uh, uh, feels like it's fake and, and and not real, which I know you you said it didn't. But to me, I don't know. I just I couldn't get really into it. I I. Well, I'd say I will say like well, the, some of the scenarios like the like the idea of like this curse and some of the stuff there's there's like some weird stuff going on. But like I think like some of the stuff like when he's like interacting with people, it feels real to me. Like it's just well, maybe how it's like shot and just like how like I don't recognize these other people. I think it's. I think this is Nathan for you, just, you know, now on Showtime, you know, at points. I will say um, the cinematography and the shots were great. I yeah. especially like the end of the uh, first episode where they're looking through the peephole across the hallway yeah. and you have the camera that's zoomed out and then it zooms in, but it's zooming in on the peephole and you're seeing like this distorted yeah. like vision of them yeah. through. And then after the conversation is done, it zooms back out to remind you that like you're not in that conversation. You're, yeah. you're, you're peeking in through the peephole in the door. And it's not like it's a, uh, it didn't feel like it was like a dolly, like push in. It was like actual yeah. camera zoom out. Um, so that was, I, I like that. I like a lot of that stuff. But I mean, we'll take, for example, the the scene with the girls on the sprites. Like yeah. that probably would have been funny if it was actually Nathan being like, oh yeah, I can't give yeah. you that money. But yeah, like, so it, that is one of the things I'll say, uh, Kyle, for in this show, um they're they're filming some stuff and you know dougie's like hey you some the little girls you know selling sprite you know trying to just make some money in, in the parking lot um they said uh, nathan go or not nathan his character go over there just you know g- give her you know some money and we can shoot it for the show showing you you're doing good and he goes over there and he's like as he's walking he sees he only has like a hundred dollars in his pocket he gives it to her and then as soon as they say cut he's like yeah I'm gonna, i just need, i need that back it's like no you gave this to me it's like, well, yeah. yeah, it was for the show. We were doing this thing for the show. I'll, I'll uh-huh. get you something else or whatever. And then that's how, like, the curse that she like, oh. gives him happens. Okay. Uh, okay. Like, it says, like, I curse you. I could see Nathan doing that in one of his bits, but yeah. it's not, like, it's a, a bit, but it's a, everybody's in on the bit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the, the other I, party isn't. I, I don't know. I don't know. It just didn't quite feel the same to me, I guess. Yeah. I will say, give it maybe like one more episode. I think like the pilot, there was it was a lot to unpack. I mm-hmm. think maybe give it one more and see if you're like I'm intrigued by this show. Uh, there's there, there's a lot going on with it, and I'm curious to see where it goes. But um, all right, uh, John, what what show do you have? Uh, I have Fargo, uh, season five, I believe, Ron. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I did not watch last season. Um, I, I watched the pilot. It seemed like it was all right, but it didn't grab me. Uh, this one felt a little bit more back to its roots in many ways. Um, we have this woman who is having a bad couple of days. <laughs> um, but like the highlight of the of the episode was this big like Home Alone esque almost yeah. gunfight that where you have two people, her and a cop, who are going against each other and and she's a superstar she's doing everything right and the cops kind of just like laying there with his leg bleeding out the whole time but you know I, I thought it was pretty good um i'm interested to see where it goes from here because it kind of seems like 
that was the action like that that could have been the the pinnacle of a, of a season you know what i mean where it was a gunfight where people were you know or doing a lot of stuff so i i not knowing the rest of the story i don't know where this is progressing to but um yeah it seemed interesting i i, I think i want to see some more before i um uh throw any judgment out beyond that um we did get some teasers of like uh i think john ham doing some stuff yeah. um it was literally him uh, praying at a table like that's all we saw of him yeah. for the whole the whole show or the whole uh, pilot so like there's obviously more to this that we haven't yet unveiled but i don't know um i'm yeah. willing to give it a couple more uh episodes to see what it does i i just think it's a little early for me to say yes or no um but yeah optimistic yeah i'd say like with the pilot what i really loved well the pilot the the premiere of this yes. uh, yeah. season is <laughs> there's there's a lot of little clues along the way that keep you guessing of why, you know, Juno Temple's character, Dottie, is is doing this. Why are two intruders wanting her? Why doesn't she want the cops mm. involved? And I feel like what I, I thought by the end of that episode, it all connects in a way, like without like hitting yourself, like you can piece it together mm. of what's going on and how John Hamm could relate to it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like, I won't get into spoilers yet. So there's been like three episodes that have aired. Mm. Uh, and, and so far I'm, I'm into it because yeah, as you mentioned, John, it's just, it's just, it's more upbeat. It's more contemporary. It's more, it has the original like charm of what I liked about Fargo, the, the humor, the quirkiness that season four, I feel like was, was not having for me. I watched the premiere or the, yeah, the first episode of four as well. And I just, I couldn't get into it. And yeah. yeah, I mean, at this, it's practically home alone. You know, it's like we got her doing all these traps like Kevin McAllister. Um, you have a, a cast of Joe Keery, Dave Foley, John Hamm. Uh, we get a lot more of them in the second episode. So I think that the first two episodes really kind of go together. And they, I think they released them as like a, a two parter gotcha. or like a, yeah. or a double premiere. I only saw the and, first one. So. Yeah, like Joe Curie is like nailing the young Midwestern son of a sheriff persona that you could expect mm. that drinks Mountain Dew and eats beef jerky in the middle. Like it's yeah, it's it's that character. Entitled, yeah. Yes. Mm. And it's good to have John Hamm back on the TV, you know, playing somebody other than himself like he does on <laughs> Curb. Like yeah. he's back. Yeah. One character I'm not thrilled with yet. I think you met her, John, at this point. Jennifer Jason Lee's character that's like the CEO uh, Dot's uh, mother-in-law. Yep. yep. For me, I mean, I know Fargo's known for the over-the-top accents, but really feeling it here with her and, and that dialogue that she's given, it reminds me, we didn't talk about it, but like Fall of the House of Usher, which came out during these last couple months, actually very similar, like, you know, like a head CEO, there's a family fixer, like instead of Dave Foley, it was Mark Hamill and Usher. And just it just reminds me too much of that, of just like, just it's over the top. It doesn't feel real. Mm-hmm. It feels like the cliche, like behind her, it has like this giant poster that says like, no, like, you know, it's like, it's very like on the nose. Um, But (laughs) even for Fargo, I can't remember, Kyle, have you seen this yet? Yeah, I've seen all three episodes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm hogging the mic here. What do you got? Uh, I I really love the show. I I felt like uh, this season is off to a great start. Uh, There's a lot happening. Um, There's some funny jokes in there i think the the funniest joke from the first uh episode was uh when they mentioned that they have an air horn yep that, i like that and then the guy blows the air horn and absolutely blows him away but immediately that was, yeah. a, that was a funny joke yeah um so it's even stuff like that um that's working i mean I, for me this this season's working i love um uh the introduction of john ham's character and and they are. They're giving you these little bits of uh, information. The suspense in that. I think what really sold me was in the first episode. The the suspense of the shootout in the yeah in the store and how it was shot was so well done. And then the story from there is is very very interesting. So yeah, I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, the only thing I will mention because I wrote this down in my notes, I forgot. Um, is I feel like in Fargo there's and I don't know if this happens in the movie so if it does uh, just tell me 
But there's oh, I feel like there's always some kind of supernatural element that kind of pulls me out a little bit. I mean, we had the aliens I, in what was that? I think that was three? I was in season three, but I don't <laughs> think it's usually in in Fargo. Like at least not the yeah. movie. Nothing I can recall from the movie. And I don't think there was anything in like season one and two. Season one was very close to mm. the movie, and yeah. then as like the series goes, it's like more yeah. of like a Coen Brothers thing. And maybe yeah. season three had the supernatural type thing of one of their movies i'm not familiar with all yeah. of their movies but i think i know what you're talking about a little bit here if you caught you're caught up yeah yeah so there's something in like the third episode we get a a big back at time flashback yeah um and, and a very interesting last image so i won't I'll, mm. I'll keep it vague for that but i do wonder where all that is going and how that yeah, connects i wonder where that's going and also even on a smaller sense i mean i don't want to give anything away for john but uh even like i feel like um juno temple and john ham's character have some kind of connection that they're able to yeah. like envision each other or something it's the it's force very... in star wars it's yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, so. yeah we'll see we'll see what's going on with that but all right, one last thing to talk about here, and it's another movie, Kyle. What do you got? So I've got Killers of the Flower Moon. Sorry, I'm just pulling up my notes. Ha, ah, notes, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, this one, I'm interested to hear what you have to say because uh, I read the book. So oh, I had to you. Yeah, and <laughs> notes and books. And who am I? But no. Um, so... I had a little bit of backstory with this, and that definitely helped round out the story because I think Scorsese does a great job of breaking this down what's a very complicated issue to be able to understand. At least that's what I gather from it. Um, So I think he did a great job with that. Um, The other thing about this movie is the acting is phenomenal. Like across the board, everyone is just doing great work, even in like smaller roles, uh, like uh, Jesse Plemons. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to me the the way they decided to go with the character because like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the book is pretty small. Yeah. But I think it leaves more open to interpretation with Robert De Niro and. Did they actually have these conversations in the background? They must have been happening. And I so I think it left them some like dramatic elements that they could play with. And I think that's why they decided to go in that direction. But in the book, Jesse Plemons character, the sh- the the sheriff, is like a way, yeah, way cooler character. A way I, I heard he was like the main character. character. And I think what happened was yeah. like I think Leo was supposed to be that character. But then I think he gravitated more towards the character he ended up with. And then they rewrote the script to really focus on, you know, Leo and, you know, kind of instead of being the like in investigation, I think it's like kind of more of like the crimes, I guess. And then mm. it ends with the investigation kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was very accurate uh, to the book. Um, and yeah, I, I wish they had kind of, gone further because i i think from the book they like it's crazy how far the conspiracy went and i feel like in the movie they because even though it was so long they just touched on some points it's like no that's crazy too like people are Mm. on their way to washington dc and they're getting kicked out of trains and all this stuff and that's just like a blip on the radar you know like this Mm. that's how deep this thing went it's crazy yeah, and I'd say for me, like, the length wasn't actually too bad for me. I mean, it helped that I was yeah. in, like, an, an Alamo recliner, bottomless soda and popcorn. <laughs> like, I was ready to go. But for, if anything, if it maybe petered out towards the end when we got to, like, the trial part. Yeah, yeah. I was really into it up until, like, you know, like, you know, through the investigation. Like, I would, more of those things that you were mentioning, Kyle, I could have taken yeah. more of that. But the courtroom mm-hmm. stuff kind of really didn't fully hit with me. Almost yeah. felt, like, tacked on. It's like, oh, yeah, we also have to do this. Yeah, you know, I agree to, to yeah. complete everything. Um, but yeah, it, it was really well done. Production design costumes. It really brought you to that period. And yeah, you mentioned the acting, especially from the core three of Leo, Robert De Niro and Lily Gladstone. De Niro, I mean, easily the best film 
you know, in years for him. Yeah. I was shocked with like his level of like energy, spryness, like him yeah. moving. I thought, you know, it's been a bit and maybe it's just I'm used to like the Irishman and, and, and you know, his other films a little bit slower. And maybe that was just like that character. But like he was really into it. Like I was really impressed with uh, what he was doing here. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Uh, it, it's dark. But it's you know it's mixed in some humors you know sometimes like with the boneheadedness of like Leo and his cronies and what they're yeah. partaking in, so it had like the little bit of the humor from like the not as humorous as like Wall Street or Wolf of Wall Street, but you know it had those levity moments in an otherwise pretty dark and depressing story at various points. Mm, yeah. But yeah, no, I I really um, enjoy this. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. Did, were you able to follow along? Okay. I, I think so. Said? I mean, I think I got like at least like the the, the, the bullet main, points, you know, yeah. from from uh, the beginning. I will say, yeah, like I think at the end, I don't know if it was just my attention span, but like yeah, the courtroom kind of stuff, you know, kind mm. of when Brendan Fraser shows up. Yeah. I'm like, All right. Like, what are we doing here? And yeah, kind of lost a little bit of steam because yeah, we then we we kind of sideline, you know, Leo. We put him in a, you know, it's it's it switches. The, the movie a bit and yeah after spending sure. three hours with him it's like wait where'd he go yep um but yep. all right i think we covered everything i think that's all we got anything else left to catch up on i think we're ready now now that we're caught up let's end the year <laughs> uh our yearly wind down is our next show next and last show of the year uh in 2023 make sure to vote uh we do this every year we ask, what's your favorite movies, television shows, and pop culture moments from the past year? And then we reveal them in our final show, which will be Monday, December 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the links in our show notes for this episode, you can find it on our social media pages. Uh, definitely vote in that because we need your help. Get your voices heard. And speaking of end of the year type stuff, the holidays are around the corner. Why not plug the DR merch store? Uh, oh, yeah. We got some shirts. We got some hats. We got some... You know, mug some some fun things there. You know, support the podcast. You know, represent. John, do you remember the the link? How 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 can they get there? I think it's uh, bit.ly/drmerch. Dr merch, all caps, I believe. That sounds right to me. Uh, it's in the Check it's the in the Gearomatic notes. store as well. So if you could find the Gearomatic store, uh, we have a we have a page with that. So. Yeah, and then we're going to be, you know, we were off for a while, but I hope you rested up because we got lots to do in January. We got the Golden Globe winners we're going to talk about. We got the Emmy predictions because that moved from September to January. And then the week after that, Oscar nominations, plus a new season of True Detectives coming out. So we got a lot to do in January. Make sure you are subscribed and ready to go. YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the blog, DuraDynasty.com. We are live Monday nights on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Dynasty, And you can follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and on TikTok at Dynasty. Next live show, Monday, December 18th, to close out the year. Uh, that's it. That's all we got. So glad to be back, guys. I, I've missed you. I missed doing this. And here we go. It's uh, let's, let's get things started. But that's next time. <laughs> Until then, I'm David Allen. Uh, I'm John Berwick. And I'm Cobbridger. And that's all we got for Dewar Duncy. Goodbye, everybody. We're back, baby.